more fun. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Andrew Castle. This is Peter Webley. Hello, everybody. And we are in San Francisco uh, during the American Geophysical Union Fall Meeting. Correct. Yeah, that, that is right. AGU 16 is the hashtag. And if you want to go see some crazy stuff, oh, there's a reporter out there. Hello. Um, <laughs> go check out what is happening down here. There's so much down here. And um, I share on social media regularly for UAF. I am lucky enough to have my job, that job. And I'm down here sharing some of the UAF uh, components of this. There's 23,000 scientists in San Francisco this week talking about about all sorts of earth science, space science, just geoscience, Biology, bio, geosciences, yeah. technology, um, exactly. and um, so education. Your, yes, yes, it's education. great to see you. Nice thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, Peter, you said you come, this is your 11th time. That's 11th great. 11th in a row. 11th straight year. And uh, this year I'm down here representing Aquasi, Alaska, Cent Alaska Center for Unmanned Systems, Air Aircraft Systems Integration. Um, and they're supporting me to come down, and I'm representing them. And, Presenting the use of unmanned vehicles in the geosciences. Uh, what is the use of unmanned vehicles in the geosciences? <laughs> well, the, the, the big one is that in, in places like Alaska, especially in a lot of, a lot of the US, there's, it's very remote. Um, we have the big cities, but there are a lot of remote areas, and you don't want to send in a manned aircraft. It can be dangerous, um, it can be in uh, hazardous conditions. So you want to say, okay, I want to get in and I want to look at a wildfire, I want to get in and look at um, sea ice or search and rescue. So you can use an unmanned vehicle that can provide you that access without putting somebody on the aircraft in danger and still get the data back. And can you go into places that humans haven't even been able to go before, like deep inside fires and things uh, like that? You could. You, obviously, there's the potential that you would um, lose your aircraft. So you've always got to have that. You've always got to look at the safety of, of, of whether the mission is viable for you. Um, so we're, as part of the, the center, are working with the Federal Aviation Agency on how to integrate unmanned vehicles into the manned airspace because we've got lots of manned aircraft in Alaska and across the planet um, so we want to make sure that the manned aircraft and the unmanned aircraft are flying safely together um, and then how to use that in geosciences so natural hazards um, biological vegetation mapping uh, sea ice monitoring sea ice mapping validation of satellite data citizen science training Alaskans to continue in STEM education um, and the aim of it is to bring them into UAF and get them through UAF, graduate through UAF, and spread the name of UAF at places like AGU and, and around, around the world. Uh, now, the Geophysical Institute, where you are based, yes, that's uh, has been using unmanned vehicles for years, correct, long yeah. before sort of this new upswell of interest. Yeah, so that. they've been using them probably since about 2001, I think, is probably when they first really kicked in. But there's been a large growth in the last four or five years uh, through support that we've had and, and projects that we've got, and we've gained part of the Pan Pacific uh, US test range complex. One of um, six one of in six, the US. Actually seven now. Seven, oh, that's, seven. Right, that's right. Um, so we're with um, Hawaii and Oregon it, when we submitted it, and we now have uh, Mississippi, Mississippi was joining us to, to be part of us back in November. That was mentioned in an interest group meeting. And my understanding is they're working with ways to make sure that it's safe for commercial operators to use it as well. Yes. It's kind so of help the FAA develop It's helped the FAA and, 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 and sort of understand how these systems integrate into the manned airspace, because that's a big part of FAA's interest, is how to do this properly under the right regulations, are you flying for educational means or are you flying for commercial, do you require a certificate to fly, what's the size of your aircraft, is it a hexacopter that you would buy off the shelf, or is it a um, several hundred thousand dollar vehicle that you bought from a commercial, big commercial vendor. And those regulations are being created? Yeah, they're being developed and the universities helping the FAA understand how to use those in every day. Now, so I've seen on TV shows like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., they have little yes. fleets and uh, swarms of right. small little uh, drones yes. and things like that. Do those exist yet, or is that just uh, science fiction? The, the people, have tried, people have looked at it. There are people like Intel that have flown 50 drones at once, um, but there is still the need that they've all got to communicate to each other. And if you're close enough to an airport or to an air traffic control center, they've got to be communicating with that because they've, they've got to know where they are relative to any aircraft in the air. Um, and if you're doing it, there's the commercial versus the non-commercial, and there's this part 107 agreement that's out about what, what height you can fly without requiring a certificate. There's classes of airspace, there's a lot of different things that go on, but when you fly a large set together, they've all obviously got to communicate. And we're actually working with NASA and the FAA on how to do that under a traffic management system. So how five drones or how five UAVs at once mm -hmm. can fly and communicate to all other UAVs on the system and the manned airspace. Amazing, amazing so, technology. So Any tips? Tip, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, this is stuff we're doing 
on the traffic management side, and there's all the science that we can do using the university, the engineering department, uh, education, uh, hazard management, uh, the um, payment security group, uh, tra transportation group, um, CNSM, um, I&E, edu uh, engineering, all these groups that UAV, even, even College of Liberal Arts, they're wanting to do cinematography with, with unmanned vehicles. So there's a huge area of growth, and it's just we're just touching the edges of it right now. Any tips you would give for someone who's thinking about getting one for a uh, Christmas gift? If you're getting one for Christmas gift, uh, look at the regulations. Uh, make sure that you're flying them correctly. Um, and uh, there are, based on weight, what, what you can and can't do. Um, and register them if they're, uh, if they're above a certain weight. Make, make sure they're registered. It's not very expensive. Um, and they're above a certain weight, you have to register them. It's, it's very easy. You just go online and pay like $5, I think it is, and you get a certificate to say yes. The FAA knows that there's a drone of this size or unmanned vehicle of this size at this location. It's very easy. I, I, I have my own personal one that I bought way before I became part of a quasi, but because it's above the requirements to be registered, I just fill out the form and I have it in my office. Now, I know you're also um, a volcanologist. Correct. And you study volcanoes. Yes. Um, and one of your big passions is how to help um, society anticipate and react to volcanic eruptions. That's correct, yes. Um, how are you using unmanned vehicles to, in your work in that regard? Yes, yeah, so that's actually an area that's, that's growing. And I think the, the biggest one is that unmanned vehicles can help us map the surface of an erupting feature, be it a lava flow. So you think of Hawaii and the Bahoa flows and the, the um, Arctic or the ocean entry flows. And then as you have small levels of activity, if you can map those and look at them over time, it tells you what's going on below. And well, if you can sample the gas, so it's the SO2 or the CO2, then you can work out what's happening under the surface and that can help you predict what's gonna happen. So by doing that with unmanned vehicles and ground observations together, you can get a better understanding of the volcano and help the volcano observatories with more data to predict what's going on. And I assume it's safer for you to send a machine Correct. up to a plume versus yeah. yourself. Exactly, as long as, you're, as long as you're able to fly. As long as the FAA have allowed it such that the aircraft can go in, then yes. Um, and if you lose an aircraft it's, and it's within your ability to do that, then obviously you can send up a, a replacement, exact copy. Um, but you obviously have your management that you require you to do that. But it's all about doing it safely, but also collecting geoscience data so we can present at conference like this and come and talk to you about what we do and, and share it to everybody else and show them what we've done with, with um, the, the work we do at the university to, to, to help everybody. And I know another thing that you're really interested in is how to get citizen science people yes, activated and exactly. use just normal, everything you have around the house, cameras and yep. things like that to study yes. uh, volcanoes or anything. Exactly, like that. and that's actually an area that we're just starting to go into, is that we want to sort of work with citizens to use what we call commercial off the shelf. They're not the sort of one, the $300 ones, they're maybe the sort of the next level up, but something that's affordable to a community or to a school or to a science organization that can use these to collect science-ready data. And is that something that a lot of scientists are doing, or are you a pioneer? Uh, you I'd say be one of a few <laughs> around the country that are doing it. I've, and actually, that's one of the things I've been doing as I've been going around the conference, is not only looking at the scientific side, but the, geo the citizen science side, to see, looking through the organization of the sessions, to see who else is doing it. And there's other citizen science projects, temperature sensors and, and things like that, but not many, maybe one or two, that's even gone down the unmanned vehicle. There's a couple of groups in Hawaii, that's a big area for unmanned vehicles that have done it, getting it into the STEM education in, in, in the schools and, and then also into the communities. But it's, it's, it's an area of growth and I think it's somewhere that we can help, um, a quasi can and the university and the institute for the state of Alaska. So if I happen to live in, uh, a remote, in the Aleutians right. and I have one of these upper level off the shelf right. unmanned vehicles yes. um, and I send it up there to take pictures right. and then I come back, is there a place for me to send that data? There will be. That's the plan. And, and by, we're working with a, looking to work with communities in the interior to start with, but obviously in the Aleutians if you took off and flew up there as long as you're flying it below 400 feet and your aircraft is of a certain weight you can do that. Um, as long as it's in the right airspace, you're not flying near Shemir Air Force Base, for example. Right, you're matching um, all the regulations. All the regulations, then yes. The aim is that you collect that data and then we can look at making topographic maps, um, looking at coastal erosion, looking at bird populations, bird, bird nests, sea ice movement, uh, the uh, surface of um, the, the ocean, uh, vegetation height, all these other data sets that we can collect. We just don't have, right now, have many ground data sets or airborne data sets as a validation. 
Like you, you get these satellite images, but you need spot information that you can compare and understand what the satellite is doing, and that's where these citizens can come in. That's pretty cutting edge technology. Yeah. It's developing exactly. as it goes along. Yes, it is. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why you come down here. You mentioned networking and yes. finding other things like that. Like yes. a quasi, it seems like it is a perfect uh, example of this thing that I hear all the time: interdisciplinary it's, studies. It's, it's interdisciplinary. It's interdisciplinary cl collaboration. A lot of the time, you can be on the phone call with somebody, or you're being on a big project, and you're talking to people on the phone or on a Skype, or like just like we are on, on using social media. But it's a lot easier when you're face to face. There's a lot more you can get done in a short period of time. So this is the place everybody comes. So coming here and finding new collaborations, but also working with existing, um, is a big big part of AGU. And then my other area of interest is this art science crossover that we've just started doing over the last couple of years, myself and my. Uh, partner Jill, have, have been, Jill Shipman, have been working on this. And this is another area that I've been looking at in, in, based on my interest in, in looking at imagery and how to visualize imagery. And that's, I mean, if you collect data, the important thing is communicating it to people who can Correct. use it. Exactly. And if you just have like a data plot and yeah. a graph, that may not mean anything to me, but if you can make a pretty picture. Exactly. Out of it. It's very useful for my own community, but to pass it on to the decision maker or to pass it on to the community that's going to use it, if you were based, at, say, in in Nome and you were wanting to use this for looking at the coastal erosion, then I want to show you something that's useful for you to make a decision. So there's got to be a better way to visualize it than we may be doing right now. So then looking at how do artists visualize things, they're looking at it to get the res response from the person. So we're looking for the same thing. So we're talking to the art community, architects, uh, painters, uh, people that work in planetariums, how to better visualize our data to make it more useful for the end user. It's difficult enough to get a bi biologist to talk to a physicist. Right. How do you get someone in the hard sciences yes. to even talk to an artist in a way that is respectful and you can start be helpful? From, start from day one. Start from day one, have a, have a dialogue. Because if you go and talk to them when you've done your project, you're not going to get anywhere. Just like with science, you start from day one, and at the end, you're talking on the right terms. So if you start from the very beginning, then six months down the line, you're not having to explain things. You already know what's happening. Whereas if you go to them with an end product, They'll go, can't understand it. And you've got to go back to square one. So start from square one. This is your 11th year yes. in a row coming here correct. to your AGU meeting. That is correct. How has it helped your career? Massively. Um, it's got me uh, projects, collaborations, uh, research grants. Um, I've been on submit, um, grant submissions for satellite missions. It's got me trips to go and work with collaborators at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, it's got me uh, on proposals in Europe. Um, and it's just it's a great place to come. Any student that's interested in the geoscientific science environment at UAF that is looking for a conference to come to, this is the place to come. Uh, UAF has a great presence here, so you'll feel part of a team. You won't be on your own in this big, wide world. You'll always be looked after. So it's, it's a great place to come for new scientists as well. And you bring that, um, the grant money, I mean, you bring the catch back to Fairbanks. Yes, we br the, the projects come to UAF and want to come back to Alaska, come to the Arctic, because they know we are the Arctic University. They want to come to us. We have an area of speciality. And they say, oh, I'll come and see you at the conference. I see you're in Fairbanks. OK, I'm going to talk to you. We even bring students. We have, I was at the university's booth uh, yesterday, and I had students coming to me saying, I want to come to UAF. What's the process? They can't do that over the phone. They can come and talk to me, and I can explain to them the exact process of what goes on. And it's a massive bonus for in bringing incoming students up to UAF. And as much as you can get from a virtual tour or a website, talking to someone and asking like a very specific exactly. question, you might be shy. Yes, in some other getting way. 10 minutes on your own with a professor who's talking to you on one-to-one -one can, make a, can make the decision yes or no if that's the university you want to go to. Thank you very much, Dr. Leverley, for taking some time. I know Thank it's you. very, very big. You're presenting how many things here uh, this week? I'm involved in eight, and I'm leading two sessions. Um, well, leading one, convening another, co-convening another, leading two presentations, um, two outreach activities in addition to this one, um, and two other meetings. I'm actually going to another meeting after this. Amazing, yes. amazing. Well, if anybody has posted questions here, I'll check that out later, and we'll follow up. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Nice to see you. Thanks, all. Thank you for joining in, and uh, we'll talk to you later.